Così. Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza. sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte dove viene il dito. Così. Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza. Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte da cui viene il dito. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. As you know, this session continues a work that was started in the meeting last year. You may remember the exhibition that last year was dedicated to TV series and that was also displayed around Italy. Maybe some of you uh, watched it after the meeting last year. And if you remember, the idea was not to provide an analysis of uh, this world, but we wanted to find and understand what fascinates, what attracts us about this Unifem TV series are a transversal and very detailed kind of language. They narrate our world, they narrate ourselves, and uh, we find ourselves 
really interested and loving these stories that are being told. And the exhibition was an attempt to try and understand the reasons behind this passion, this passion for uh, human stories and the stories of characters. So the proposal was to meet some protagonists of TV series. Then there was another part that uh, was useful to read and interpret the encounter with these characters. And among the people that helped us doing this, there was one of the guests that this year, thanks to God, is here in presence with us. Neil Landau is here with us. Please give him a round of applause. Welcome. Neil, Neil is a showrunner, producer, author of TV series, and he screenplayed a series such as Narrow Place, Melodorf Place, Undressed. He's also professor, executive director of the MFA Film Festival, Television and Digital Media Program of the University of Georgia, and he is author of this book that is the TV showrunner's roadmap which we can say is the Bible for those working in this sector, because he interviewed and followed and explained the showrunners, the producers, the screenwriters of all the major TV series that are produced and that also arrive to Italy. It's not uh, easy to find the author of the Bible every day, so it's really great to have you here. And the other guest uh, here today is uh, equally renowned and important. Please give him a round of applause, uh, Armando Fumagalli. I can say he is the main scholar in Italy about this uh, subject. He teaches semiotics at the Catholic University of Milan. And he is also director of the International Screenwriting and Production Master's Degree course. And he's not just a professor. Yesterday, we were kind of mapping informally uh, all the uh, students of yours that are now working in uh, uh, the TV industry. He was really able to uh, help a lot of people working in this uh, sector. And his book also is not maybe the Bible, but is the main encyclopedia of this sector, written together with Cassano Albani and Paolo Braga. And uh, here is another great friend of ours that will help us deepen into the subject that we selected for this session. And the title, Fragile Heroes. Why is it so? One of the things that we found out last year working on the world of TV series is that one of the common traits that uh, really fascinate us the most, and it was one of the common traits of the protagonists of the exhibition, those six, seven characters from very diverse series, they all had one common feature. This was different from the protagonists of uh, cinema and films. These are not heroes. These are not perfect characters. They're not uh, happy end stories uh, characters where the good uh, character will beat the bad character and able to solve all the problems. These are all heroes and protagonists that have uh, some fragile parts. They have uh, dark sides, they have doubts, they have uh, some form of unease. And these elements, in some way, can be found in us. So that's where we wanted to start from. So the first question I want to ask Neil is about uh, this uh, topic. It's about this fragility, this vulnerability. Why is it so important in telling the world through the TV series key? Great question. Um, thank you all for being here. And I just want to say it's such an honor to be able to be here and experience Rimini and this wonderful festival. So I'm very grateful and appreciative to be here. Um, and if I sound a little divided in half, it's because I'm listening to translation at the same time that I'm speaking. <laughs> so bear with me. So the, 
the frailty of characters having both strengths and weaknesses. I was thinking about this just at the essence of a story before there is a show. First, you have to start with the writer. I've been a professional writer in Hollywood for 35 years. And to be a screenwriter, you have to start with paradox just like with characters having positive and negative. There's an, there is a paradox of just being a writer, of being an artist, of being a filmmaker, and that is to be a great storyteller for the screen, you have to be very sensitive as an artist, but you also need a thick skin because it's a business. And so I always find myself also torn between needing to be very uh, vulnerable with on the page with my words and with my characters. And yet in real life, the business side, I have to be very strong. So it starts just with the writer having the courage to face a blank page. It's the most difficult thing. Sometimes I say to my graduate students, it's not rocket science, it's harder <laughs> because you are starting with nothing and you have to create the world. In terms of characters uh, having positive and negative traits, when you think of characters that stand the test of time, whether they're protagonists for the screen, the big screen movies, or television, is our goal as, a, as writers is to um, create a complexity to the character just like in real life. So characters that stand the test of time, I say, are iconic characters. These are characters like Tony Soprano, Olivia Pope, uh, characters who on the surface are very strong, but with, in terms of point of view, the audience sees their vulnerabilities. And the reason why vulnerability is so important, along with strength, or another way to put it, is they have a, um, an expertise with a liability. Dr. House on the show House, the medical show, he's a brilliant doctor. He knows how to heal people, but he himself is very broken. He walks with a cane, he takes pain medications, and the other core contradiction, which is the paradox, is he hates his patients. <laughs> so he heals people, but he's a misanthrope. He also hates people. So right away, when you have a character with a core contradiction, they're much more fascinating. It's not superficial. He's, it's not one thing or the other. It's both. It's both at the same time. Tony Soprano, he's a ruthless mobster. He's, he's a murderer. He's a criminal. But he also suffers from panic attacks. He goes to therapy. He takes Prozac. He's a husband. He's a father. So you, you might think, how do these things go together? They don't. And that's what makes the show so interesting and why he's such an iconic character. And one more thing, so I don't take up all the time with this question. We relate to these characters because over time, we, we see how they're uniquely flawed and vulnerable. But part of human nature is that when we have a vulnerability, the first thing we do is we try to hide it from other people. At the core of hiding our vulnerabilities is the idea of shame. Shame is the fear of disconnection. It's the fear that you will not be accepted by society, by your family, by your co-workers, and that ultimately you'll be alone because no one will understand you. And 
all people, not just characters, because great characters are, are like us. They're people. That's what makes them relatable. One of the things about all of us is we are all struggle and strength. That's just part of being alive. We struggle and then we overcome things. We don't always win. We don't always lose. And what that leads to is the idea of empathy. And empathy is the acknowledgement that we are, str we are all struggle and strength. And when we see really strong characters over many seasons of a TV show, we understand how they feel. So I don't know what it's like to be a mafia boss, you know, like Tony Soprano, but I know what it feels like to be a father, to be a, to be a husband, to struggle to be in my, in professionally, to succeed professionally, to go to therapy. <laughs> I go to therapy. And at the core of all of this with empathy is that nobody is perfect. And I find that very reassuring because as we all struggle through life, we look to some of the heroes of shows and say, well, they struggle too. <laughs> we all struggle. And yet we also have the ability to transcend our fears. And when we transcend our fears, we display courage. And then we go back to the writer and the artist because making art requires great courage. It's the only way you get it done. You have to have faith that something that is invisible presents itself. So it's the invisible telling its, its shape. And, at, and then we get to the truths about who the characters are. And over time, we make discoveries about who they are as they evolve. Abbiamo già tracciato un, un, uh, <laughs> piantato un paletto in well, we've just, uh, we've already mentioned a very important element. We have understood why we feel related to these characters and to these protagonists. Now, Armando, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, weight of this uh, empathy that uh, Neil mentioned. And uh, there is another question that was uh, raised many times when we traveled with uh, the exhibition. Many times this empathy, this link, is also felt with characters that are anti-heroes and are negative heroes. Tony Soprano is not uh, a model as such. So what is this about? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure for be, to, to be here with Neil. We've been knowing each other for years now, and we've also collaborated. We have common friends, so, and we also share the general pleasure of being here at the meeting. And so I'm very happy to be here with him. And I have to say that I, I did my homework, and uh, I saw the question that was related to the session, and I thought about it. Uh, the topic of empathy is discussed very well by Neil in his book. We said before that uh, screenwriting books uh, talk about many topics, but uh, almost never they talk about a fundamental theme that I always mention in my lessons for my students, uh, that is empathy. A uh, fundamental question indeed, so that a TV series or a movie can work, can be successful, is that we can resonate and uh, love and feel close to the characters. We call empathy, uh, we call this empathy, and uh, Neil provides a more technical definition, but basically this is about it. And what has happened over the last few years is that there has been a further development and sophistication of this industry. And in the US, many TV series have been designed for niche audiences and not mainstream audiences. So there's been the taste and the will of screenwriters to work on very articulated and very complex and very problematic characters. And why do we love these characters? I thought about a thing that really impressed me. Some years ago, there was a book that uh, it was called Beyond the Screen and was translated into Italian. And it was called uh, Christians in Hollywood in Italian. It was a series of testimonies by Hollywood writers and producers 
that were Christian and Catholic or Protestant Catholics that talked about their work. And there was an essay by Barbara Hall, who is a, a showrunner who did uh, John of Arcadia and other series. And uh, she said that when I write and I deal with my characters, somehow I find myself in the place of God. That is, I love them even when they do something wrong, something bad. So I believe that when we narrate well, when we tell a story well, we get the audience to take this point of view, to take this perspective. So we manage to have understanding. And I dare to use a word that is used by Pope Francis very much, it is linked and it's not out of place. And we are even merciful about these characters. Even when we know that they are behaving badly, he gave the, uh, Neil gave the example of Tony Soprano, but we can also consider other movies that maybe they are more known universally. A very classic movie like Amadeus, the Salieri protagonist does a lot of wrong things, but we understood why and we love him anyway. So this is a technical skill in writing and also technical a human skill of understanding that can obviously help those watching TV series and those uh, listening to these profound narrations and sophisticated narrations not to be banal and to have a richer, a more articulated and more complex view over human subjects, human matters. For example, those who uh, read great novels and watch great TV series that are well done are more likely to be more open-minded. But what is the risk on the other side, especially if um, there is a sort of bulimic uh, use of TV series and content, and if this work is done in an intelligent and sophisticated way, some aspects are always more highlighted than others. Um, I have a very easy example. The Godfather, for Michael, if we watched him from outside, from the outside, if we read that uh, in the news, uh, we would consider this a multi murderer person, head of the mafia, and we even may forget that uh, the, uh, he killed a lot of uh, people, even his brother-in-law. and. Good narration is able to put the spotlight on some aspects and let us forget about some others. So 30 seconds of moral metaphysical philosophy, if I am allowed to do that, that's because evil is always the choice of a lower level good, a disordered good, so to say, but it's not a pure evil as such. So if I am able to put the spotlight on the good side, such as in The Godfather, Michael is defending his family. He wants to protect. He wants not to be killed by the others. So I'm saying this because the beauty of TV series and what they are bringing to our culture is something that is really subtle and a lot of complexity in seeing, in viewing human beings and not being banal. So if there is a risk there, is that uh, if we have some uh, good principles and gets a bit confused because of uh, a big mixture, ethical mixture, maybe at the end of the day may get lost and may lose track of where one should go. This is true, but there is this capacity that is more and more sophisticated and that is more and more appreciated because we sometimes get really surprised to see how we get in, we fall in love with some characters like in breaking bad some one has done it wrong but we love him from the very beginning since the very beginning because the very 20, first 20 minutes, the pilot in Breaking Bad, there are so many uh, things that are happening. Okay, you are um, giving amphetamines uh, out, but uh, we love it anyway. And from a moral point of view, instead, there is something very good because there is a story that has the structure of a tragedy. We see someone who does wrong, 
and we see that this uh, wrongdoing leads him to self-destruction. This is Shakespeare, basically. Breaking Bad is Shakespeare in five seasons instead of being two hours, two hours and a half of tragedy. What is different then is the uh, stories where the line between good and bad is blurred or is cancelled or is uh, blurred a lot or sometimes uh, we have to say is also confused in some way. I think that this links up to something very important, the responsibility we have when we watch a screen because uh, we are involved so it's up to us what to watch how to watch in a passive way or maybe give credit to what you are watching and uh, letting what you're watching growing in us but you used the word that struck me because that coincides with the with the word that neil used for the contribution you he sent us. He talk, you talked about mercy. You talked about the need for forgiveness and redemption. So what does that mean? And what that, that, what does that tell us about ourselves? The fact that many characters of these uh, shows, I mean, uh, come across difficulties and problems, uh, and they have a strong and deep need of redemption or, or forgiveness? Well, when I was writing about empathy, I started to really think about what's at the core of it and why is it important. And what I came, kept coming back to was the idea that the most difficult thing that all of us will ever be required to do in our lives, and you might be thinking about somebody right now as I'm saying this, is to forgive because we all make mistakes. It's part of being human. And empathy is when you understand maybe why somebody did something. In Breaking Bad, Walter White starts off as an underdog. He has terminal lung cancer. He has a wife. He has a special needs son. He has a baby on the way. So part of empathy is to say, he's caught, like Armando said, he's caught between two wrongs, between both situations. If he does nothing and he does not start cooking math, when he dies, he's going to leave his family with a lot of struggle. So that whole pilot is designed to make him an underdog and somebody who we may not approve of what he does initially, but we understand why he's doing it. That's a really important point. So in a TV pilot, the first episode, by the end of the pilot, I tell my students, we have to have alignment, meaning the audience is on board to go on this journey with the character. After the first episode, we go from alignment to allegiance. Allegiance is um, a fluid process. Some episodes we approve of what they do, sometimes we don't. The most important thing is that we stay engaged, we stay present to see what choices they're going to make because we understand why on a certain level. I'd also like to make a distinction between something that's very mysterious about storytelling and characters in general, which is separating facts from emotion. If you look at the facts of something like Breaking Bad, a lot of it doesn't make sense in terms of how the audience relates to his character. We were talking about this last night. Walter is the one who breaks the law, who murders, who loses his all of his ethics and morals completely over the course of the series. And yet Skylar, his wife, was the one who most of the audience really disliked very strongly. Why? She did nothing wrong. <laughs> and it's because emotionally we connect much more with Walter because 
for the character, from the point of view of a character. Characters have conscious goals and unconscious goals or subconscious goals. You could also say characters have wants, which are more superficial conscious goals, and then they have needs, which are the things that they really need to sustain themselves. And those are usually driven by emotion. Without emotion, uh, there's no empathy. Emotion, uh, the main component of empathy is that we have an emotional connection with the characters. And I, I don't know if this translates well, but I'll hear in a second. There's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Are these two different words in Italian? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. Sympathia. So it's two different words. Okay. So I'm going to clarify what that means. When I was six years old, my family lived in a very small apartment in Queens, in New York. And I have a very good memory that helps me as a writer. I remember waking up very early in the morning and every, my mother and my elder brother were asleep. My father was awake and he was putting on his basketball shoes. It was Sunday morning and he went every Sunday morning he would go to play basketball with his friends. I remember the morning so well because I used to climb on his big shoulders and hug him and I remember his aftershave and he had stubble and so he went off to play basketball. About an hour and a half later, my mother was making breakfast for me and my brother, and the phone rang. My mother got very upset. Next thing I know, her best friend Loretta came to our apartment to watch me and my brother. My mother went to the hospital by herself. And she said, I'm looking for my husband. I was told he was brought here. No computers back then. And the person at the reception desk looked through her notes and she said, oh, you need to go to the morgue. That's how my mother found out that my father, at the age of 39, had died. He collapsed on the basketball court. He had a heart attack. He never even made it to the hospital. I mean, he died in the ambulance. So those are the facts of the story. If you just look at the facts, without all the details I gave you, you might have sympathy for me. What a shame, what a pity. How sad. But the point of my story was to foster empathy. And the reason why it's empathy and not just sympathy is that I provided context for the story. I, I, I told you a story with detail that ev it evoked emotion and then you feel something. So empathy is much more complex. My mother told me, I was six years old, she said, when the phone rang, she said, I just said, daddy's dead. I didn't even, I had no idea. She said, you just said that. And I said, really? And then I can only imagine, as you might imagine, what it would be like for my mother with barely high school education, not sophisticated, all by herself, going to a hospital and finding out her entire life just collapsed. It changed everything. We, I'm telling you this story in relation to empathy because to generate empathy, you need details, you need specifics about feelings and emotions, and you need to set the stage. That story has pretty much informed everything I've ever written in my entire life. 
I write about loss, grief, abandonment, what it is to be a man, because I didn't grow up with a father, what it means to be a father because I have two sons. And for me, and I find this with my students and many of my friends who are very successful screenwriters and showrunners, there is often a story that we keep returning to in our work, in our fictional work, and some of our autobiographical work. And the reason we keep returning to this story is because we're trying to solve it and make sense of it. Because I never could understand why this happened. All of my friends had their fathers. Why did this happen? It felt very random. And what I really felt was abandoned by my father, even though it was not his fault. And the key lesson to this whole story <laughs> is it's taken me almost 50 years to forgive him because it felt like he left. The facts are he had a heart attack and died and it was not his choice, but the emotion of the, little, of the boy was he left me. Maybe it was my fault, maybe he didn't love me. All I knew was there was this gigantic emotional void in my life. And when you're writing from a very deep level, you're always trying to fill the emotional void for your characters. So when you're looking at empathy in a story, it's not just vulnerability of the characters, but it's an emotional void that you might spend your entire life trying to fill. And in a TV series, you'll never run out of story because the void is so vast. Well, this desire to fill this void and to fill this demanding heart is the trigger that pushes characters to evolve and to change throughout the TV series. It's one of the effects that uh, uh, TV series uh, give us is the fact that uh, there we see this full narration of this desire to change. Uh, characters do evolve. So what does it mean? This evolution that we see is not just about the desire to see what happened next to the character, but uh, it's something more profound. There is the desire to see something that relates to us, to feel somehow our own void that Neil mentioned. Definitely, yes. I have so many things now in my mind that try to put them in order. First of all, what we mentioned before, that is the ability to create empathy can give us the point of view of God uh, on the people. That is a loving point of view, even when they do wrong. Consider, for example, the life of others the movie, we see characters that do wrong, but we love them anyway, even if they do wrong. This is not easy. This is a great capacity, and for the uh, audience, is an enlightenment. At the same time, we see characters that need to change, that have voids to fill, and rightly so, Neil, in his book, says that it's not so much that the plot is important, but it is uh, the character, the evolution of the character. In well-written stories, we understand that uh, characters have to solve problems, that have to uh, fulfill something, that have to fill a void. And then there's also technical problems that, for example, there are limited series or longer series, but we can't deal with that. But in a limited series, is a kind of long movie, six, eight hours. For example, The Queen's Gambit uh, or other mini-series, Cher Chernobyl, for example, and other series like these. Uh, 
I have to say that uh, starting with these uh, short uh, series formats, there is one point uh, I wanted to mention, and it is a kind of encouragement that I want to make, because there are some Italian TV series that are really interesting uh, from this point of view. I know that young people, especially Italian young people, do not really trust Italian TV series. But then some things happen. For example, Mario Fuori, that uh, was uh, broadcast uh, on uh, the main Italian state channel, and then it was uh, broadcast on Netflix, and everybody loved it. Blanca, for example. So there is this feature that is different from American TV series that uh, are broadcast on general broadcasting channels, but the cable done, the one on platforms, we can see characters with a lot of negative sides. Instead, in Italy, TV series show more positive-minded positive, uh, positive minded characters, so to say. And I think it is interesting to consider these uh, differences and uh, assess these differences because some very sophisticated things can be awarded a lot, but uh, the audience uh, still are still niche audience. Last night we talked about Succession, which is a very sophisticated, very complex series. They, now they have two million audience in, uh, on HBO in a country of 300 million people, and it's a small number. But uh, Italian TV series sometimes gets a very high TV viewers' ratings with a very well-designed product. I would like to mention a couple of them. I know that some people in this room worked on them. One is the Dock in Your Hands. That is a very nice production. Yeah, and this really enhanced uh, uh, Italian TV series at an international level. The series was sold in many countries, and it was the most watched in France when it was broadcast. And then another series that is more niche series, but very well designed, that it is Devils. And these signs are really, really interesting to see the evolution and the growth of Italian TV series, because we study American TV series, and we try to get the best part of them and we try to go ahead and uh, try to develop uh, uh, our series more, especially the people that work on them, and try to bring out the best on the products that really express our personal sensitivity. Same question for you, Neil. Why do we really need that the characters have to change? Do they gain in their humanity in a way? They, do they become better or worse? They evolve in the course of a series. Just being alive, we change all the time. But with an important distinction, we have our comfort zones. So we have our modus operandi. And then we take risks. We're compelled to step out of our comfort zones. Or if you're fearful to step out of your comfort zones, it's one of the reasons why you go to the movies and watch television, because you can have a vicarious experience of watching other people step out of their comfort zones, but you can sit on your couch with your remote control and uh, it's what I call empathy on demand. You don't have to experience any of these extreme pulls out of your comfort zones, but you can watch other people do it. And it actually does satisfy, it does have a, uh, the, like the Greeks say, it's, uh, it's cathartic. So you can experience an emotional release as an audience member, even if you're not doing anything. Like watching television is the most passive thing you can possibly do. And yet, if you look at neurology and brain chemistry, when you watch a really suspenseful show or you watch a show where you feel very much like you're part of their lives, it's like your second life because you're so involved, 
in their lives over a period of time, you, uh, you can have an emotional release. That's what catharsis is. So you can laugh, you can cry, you can hide from the screen. Even though you know it's make-believe, it triggers you to actually feel real emotions and it will spike your serotonin levels. So your brain chemistry will react as if it's happening to you. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, all characters enter a story with history and so, many, so much of what happens that creates these emotional voids happened in the past. And so there's this kind of um, duality of the storyteller, which is a central question. We're waiting to discover some kind of truth. And that's where you keep watching because you want to see what's going to happen next. So a central question is always about the future. We keep watching to find out what's going to happen. But you also have to remember, at the same time, on a parallel track, there's the central mystery, and that involves the past. So the central question is, what's going to happen? The central mystery is, what happened? Why are these characters behaving this way? And I wanted to just mention Succession, which is a niche, is a niche show. When I first watched Succession, how many people have seen Succession? It's pretty popular in Italy, right? Some. Niche. <laughs> um, when I first watched Succession, I thought, why should I care about any of these people? They're billionaires, they're greedy, they're selfish. And the, for me, the, the clue comes from the opening credit sequence where you see all of these very self-absorbed characters as children and you see them in relation to their father who's always out of focus or distracted on his phone or walking away from them. When you see the children on the tennis court, for example, there's no joy. They're just standing there very with no, no expression whatsoever. And I mention this because part of empathy and character evolution is, for me, my curiosity is what's wrong with this picture, is what it evokes. What's missing? So in succession, just in the opening credit sequence, what's missing? Smiles, laughter, joy, play, and there's no mother. She's not there. Then the episode begins, and you see them all as adults, but they're damaged. I wrote a chapter in this new book called Lifestyles of the Rich and Damaged. And that vulnerability, for me, for me, they're all extremely vulnerable because every relationship within the family is purely transactional. So instead of love or unconditional love, everything is based on money, approval, the power. And that's not what really is at the core of a family. So I, just like I thought, why can't I have a mother and a father and a normal family? Even though they're multi-billionaires, they also have these emotional voids. So I think that's an important distinction. So as the story's going forward, the evolution is the past keeps tugging, keeps tugging them back. And, uh, and I, as a, story, as a viewer and as a storyteller, I always want to be open and to, to discover new dimensions of my characters that I didn't even think of. It's part of the mysterious aspect of creation. You don't know why things occur to you. You don't know, oh, there's this, you know, something from the past, and I'll just, one more tiny thing. This is such a transformational thing for storytellers and artists, but especially storytellers. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the author, 100 Years of Solitude, Love in the Time of Cholera. He has this great quote about character, and he says, we all lead three lives.
our public life, our private life, and our secrets. As a storyteller, the thing that's always most absolutely most fascinating to me are the secrets. <laughs> and when I discover what is hidden, that's part, that's part of the evolution, because when you get a new piece of information, it changes everything. Even, it might sound like my mother was crazy, because she kind of was, but I've been writing for 35 years. It wasn't, I, I started writing plays, I've always been writing. She didn't tell me that my father's secret desire or passion was to be a writer. <laughs> She didn't tell me this till I was in my 40s. <laughs> I thought, Mom, don't you think that would have been an interesting thing to tell me? That really changed things for me. <laughs> anyway. One more. My mother remarried when I was nine to a very controlling, violent, abusive man. I had a very bad stepfather. He had two rules for me. I'm not allowed to write, so he took away my typewriter. <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to watch television. He said, go outside and play sports. Go play ball. I never wanted to play ball or sports. It didn't occur to me till I was 45 years old, the reason. My father died playing ball. So we're always making discoveries about ourselves, about other people, but we don't always know. And that's part of evolution. It's like an epiphany, which is supposed to be a sudden realization, but a lot of epiphanies take many years until you finally get the spark. So. So, I ask you another personal question. Is there any series or characters on which maybe you worked or you came across with that helped you somehow, helped you more to fill that void? I ask this to you, Neil, and then to Armando as well. That's a great question. Well, I can say more recently, and I don't know how many people saw this show, but did anybody see WandaVision on Disney Plus? I think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and WandaVision, just like Schitt's Creek, um, Euphoria, another show I, I love. I think it's brilliant. Um, at the core of those shows is, is loss. And Jack Schaefer, who was the head writer of WandaVision, she said she structured the, seat, the whole limited series according to the five stages of death and dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. But it's not sequential. It's not like you go through anger and then that's over, and then you go to, you know, anger, bargaining, de you know, denial, bargaining. Grief is back, forth, back, forth. And so any shows where there was a loss, I was always watching to see if when they were going to heal because I wanted to heal. <laughs> And so I found watching television, I was kind of raised by television because I was written, my mother worked full time and I would come home and put on the television. That was my best friend. And so I was looking for people who could overcome what seemed like impossible challenges. And it showed me that you can overcome them. But WandaVision had a really strong effect on me because she has to let go of a vision and it's the hardest thing she'll ever have to do. Per te Armando c'è una 
What about you, Armando? Is there a series or a character that made you progress? Well, personally, I realize that I like uh, normal people stories, normal characters. Everything we said about uh, uh, the baddies or bad characters, personally, I don't feel that much involved, well, at least so far. Well, my top five would be the following. So, uh, Downtown Abbey, and then a Pachinko, a recent Apple TV Korean series that is wonderful, in my opinion. Because I think that there is an interesting challenge lying here. Well, uh, Julian Fellowes, the Downtown Abbey author, said, well, I'm convinced that the vast majority of people are decent people, but their life is interesting. It has conflicts because the problem technically is also to say, let's quote somebody from, well, that has education. So, so to show how Tolstoy got it wrong when he said that all family, all happy families uh, look alike, but uh, each unhappy family is unique. Well, actually, I think that also happy uh, families are unique, and there's a lot to tell, because even normal life, uh, I mean, entails conflicts, and technically, this is what the Downton Abbey author did, because if you look at the series, the characters uh, are normal people. They are not criminals, psychopaths, murderers, but still, the series is so interesting and full of uh, interesting things, very much intriguing, because he was able to do a great storytelling because, I mean, let's take Billy Elliot's story. A young boy wants to become a dancer. It was a huge world success so much loved all over the world for the last 20 years. People keep watching it because the story was told in an amazing way, like the King's Speech. I know the, the writer because he came to us, he won an Oscar, and he said, okay, I went to Hollywood, and I was told, no, I mean, people won't be interesting in a, a, such a character, in a stuttering character. Well, the, the thing was not to, to see the stake from the outside. It's how you can tell a story, how you can make people understand what lies uh, beneath. And that's a great challenge. And uh, I really like the idea of telling in a deep, involving, and interesting way stories that are not about psychopaths, murderers, and criminals, but just decent, normal people. And, well, it also depends on, uh, I mean, uh, your own experience and background. As Neil perfectly said, each one of us, at the end of the day, in everything they write, uh, series, films, novels, their own story, their own personal story. And now, well, I really like to touch upon an idea and submit this idea to all of you. Well, the industry is growing in Italy as in the rest of the world, so it's important to have many voices and uh, diversified uh, different voices because it's interesting to listen to different experiences with different uh, points of view. And it would be nice to also have the point of view of the people uh, experiencing uh, events like the meeting. So, for instance, why not? So, there are so many experiences to be told about what life is, uh, our problems, what a family is, what is forgiveness, what is love. I think that that would be a great challenge. It's an open issue. And maybe in three or five years, uh, this bubble will end. I don't know. I don't think so. We all need uh, uh, entertainment. And Robert McKee, in a book, says, that when he talked to his mother once, he said, oh, people would always need entertainment in, in the deepest meaning of the word. So stories, helping them explore the world, investigate the world, and uh, live, I mean, intensely somebody else's life. This is, at the end of the day, what to do through stories. We live somebody else's life. So, the market is open. Just uh, take a shot. <laughs> I have another dozen of questions, but time 
is running out. Just a very quick question with a, also a quick answer to Neil, because Another thing that struck us last year is that when you talked about the uh, TV series, you also use the word hope. So watching series gives me hope. Please tell us why. And, and remember, I know we're out of time, so <laughs> I'll yeah, keep yeah. this short. <laughs> so don't get mad at me. <laughs> um, because the television and movie business is now global. It's not just that shows and set in other places are being licensed and adapted into English. We're actually seeing shows that are in their local territory and there's in the local language and it's available to us all over the world. So La Casa de Papel, My Brilliant Friend, Squid Game, we see how people live all over the world. And what it shows us is that what makes us the same is much greater than what divides us. So that plants seeds of empathy. Because you might think, look at what's happening in Ukraine now and in Russia. If you watch shows set in Africa, set in different parts of the world, and you fall in love with the characters, you think they're just like me. Why, why do I hate anybody? And that gives me hope. Because I have friends all over the world now through all these shows set all over the world. And we don't just look at it from one perspective. And that's what is dangerous when you only see one side. I like to see all sides. And is anybody here from Russia or Ukraine? Nobody. Um, I spoke at a big conference like this in Russia many years ago, and I said in Russian, "Ya grajdenin mira," which means "I am a citizen of the world." And if, as a citizen of the world, it gives me hope that we can all come together. It's the only way that I can see that we can. Uh, that we can save the world on every level. So through story, one story at a time. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Neil. I think that, well, we have uh, talked about what makes uh, characters human. And I mean, there's so much human-based uh, material work uh, in the stories that uh, are compelling. They are compelling because uh, they find uh, in those stories uh, something that uh, we all share, humanity. And uh, our guests talked about themselves, and this is humanity. So, I mean, it is up to us to choose the attitude you want to have when you are on the couch with the remote on hand. It's a fascinating, I mean, job, and uh, we can enrich our gaze on the world and our humanity, and I think that our uh, great friends and guests uh, said it very clearly, that humanity is the key. We would have so many questions. I would have so many, and Armando also has to go back to Lisbon. He came uh, straight away from in Lisbon. Thank you for coming, really, for being so generous. He came and Neil will fly back together the, tomorrow, sorry, so he will spend more time with us. And today at four, if you want, we can keep talking with him in the Tilio room and uh, on the ground floor of Hall 6. We can uh, keep talking informally with the person who is I mean, sharing something of his own experience with us. So not just his expertise, but a piece of his life. It's great. Thank you. So the meeting continues at 4 in the Tilo room. For all the others, let's realize that such meetings, such encounters exist only here thanks to the meeting. And the meeting exists if we support it. So please, 
let me remind all of you the need and opportunity, if you can, to make even a little donation. Every little helps. So there are the Donate Now desks with a red heart. And from this year on, the Meeting Foundation has become a third sector entity. So you can also have tax breaks if you make donations. But most of all, you help us keep having such great rich enriching encounters. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Così. Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza. Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte dove mi ricredo. Così. Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza. Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte da cui viene qui. 